We don't have Adil here, so I can introduce David. David Husby from Appalachia Security Maven. Yay, so fancy, cool. Uh, so uh, that's David Husby uh, from Hyperledger. He's a security maven, and today he'll tell you a little bit about a little bit or a lot about his open source um, experience. So and about Hyperledger yeah. and something else probably. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So I came a long ways to be here. I I live in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. So it was um, 20 hours of traveling to get here. I've been over at the Techno Park all this week. And earlier this week, um, Slava, I don't know if you, uh, Slava right there goes, I know, I have a good idea. <laughs> so I've learned that anytime Slava says he has a good idea, it's usually not a good idea. Yeah, uh, I was like, okay, what's this good idea? He's like, I get it. We're, you're going to give a lecture on Thursday night about what you do. Um, and uh, don't say no. So I, I'm here. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, Sarah's right. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hyperledger. But um, I've been an open source developer and involved in security for a very, very long time. I have a lot of gray hair to prove it. Um, and I was, gonna ho I was hoping that at least after I get through these slides, it should be 10 minutes, um, that if you had any questions about being open source developers or just my experience with Linux, the Linux Foundation, um, I can talk a little bit about my career. Um, I'll, I'll get to that when I get to my introduction slide. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I've ever done or anything that I might have been involved with, um, I'd love to just, we'll have a conversation about it, I guess. So um, as Sar said, I'm uh, the security maven for Hyperledger, which means that I'm in charge of all of the security related stuff um, with the Hyperledger projects, which are open source projects uh, built around blockchains, blockchain platforms, related technologies, and things like that. So I'm the security maven. I have been an open source developer for 25 years now. Uh, it's, let's see, I started using Linux in 1994 and on a computer that I built from spare parts that I found in a trash container at the university in my town. And so it was an ancient computer that I had to do a lot of work to to get, get it to work. I think it had two megabytes of RAM, I think, yeah. And uh, it ran Linux barely, but it ran Linux. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of open source projects over the years. Um, I've worked for Mozilla for four and a half years. And so I was uh, platform security on Firefox. And I worked uh, with the Tor project and the Tor browser. Um, I've also worked in the web industry back in the late 90s. So did a lot of work with dynamic server, um, dynamic generated pages, right? Server side business logic and things like that. So everything we take it gra for granted today, the fact that you can write scripts that run on a server to generate data, generate web pages. Um, I was part of a group of engineers that went through figuring all of that out. Um, I've worked in video games. I've worked in aerospace. I, I did some work for Boeing for a while. I've worked uh, probably the most fun job I've ever had. I worked for four years at Linden Lab making Second Life. Do you guys, any of you know what Second Life was? It's the was the largest shared virtual reality um, platform ever created, and I think it still is. I don't know, maybe there's some adult-oriented ones that have a lot more people in them today, but you know, it was, it was absolutely massive and that was a ton of fun to do, solve a lot of problems. Um, the last 10 years of my career, I've been focusing on software engineering, software like how to write secure code. And um, when I was at Mozilla, I got involved in my free time uh, with the Rust programming language. And I helped port Rust over onto all of the BSD operating systems because they already had Linux support. and. Uh, I wanted to learn more about compilers and how Rust worked. Um, so I, I ported the compiler over to FreeBSD and NetBSD and OpenBSD. So I did that in my free time for about three years. And uh, that really focused me 
on how to make programmers better at what we do from a security standpoint. And that led me to getting this job at Hyperledger um, when Hyperledger started up a couple years ago. Uh, what is Hyperledger? I don't even know these slides, so I'm going to read them to you. I, I, the, Hyperledger is a global consortium on blockchain. We're building what are called permission blockchains. They're blockchains where, unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum, where anybody can run a node, Hyperledger blockchains are designed for applications where everybody running nodes are known. So where you have, say, an industry of companies that want to collaborate on a, a certain piece of their, their business, they uh, use Hyperledger software because um, you can get faster block times, you can get faster finality times, you can get um, much higher throughput for transactions, you can build all kinds of custom logic. Um, and if, if any of you don't know, the reason I'm here is because I'm visiting uh, Soramitsu over in Technopark because they are the authors of one of the Hyperledger projects, Hyperledger Aroha, which is um, about to go 1.0 here real soon, hopefully. Uh, Hyperledger is made up of, it's been around, well, so this is an old slide. This is actually the slide from last year. It was launched uh, three years ago and we have, actually I have the updates here. So we were launched three years ago. Um, we've added 10 labs, including in, in addition to our five blockchain frameworks and five tool projects. Um, that's actually a plus one, but it will be plus two. So the number of projects that are in 1.0 production is will be four. It's three now. But with Aroha going 1.0, it'll be four. Um, we have, let's see, can I? Yeah. So we have uh, 270 plus uh, corporate sponsors, which gives us a lot of money to do marketing and, and to support things like me traveling to, uh, to here um, to help out our community and our developers. Uh, let's see here. We have this actually here is a much higher number. We have probably almost 200 meetups now. And we have meetups pretty much everywhere on the planet. Um, and this number is actually much higher too. Anyway, Hyperledger is, is uh, slowly growing. Well, not slowly growing. It's slowly taking over a lot of um, enterprise applications um, for blockchain. And we're finding that we have developers all over the planet. I get emails every once in a while in a language I don't even recognize. And I've been on the internet my entire life, and I'm shocked. You know, I had to look one up the other day. It was a regional language in uh, Mongolia. I was like, wow. And it was I, once I figured out how to get Google Translate to translate it, I got enough out of it that the, the guy was emailing me about getting T-shirts so that he could organize a meetup. And apparently, it's cold in Mongolia, so they want clothes. Um, so the Linux Foundation is actually made up of a bunch of groups of projects. Some of these you've probably already heard of, like the Node.js project. That's under the Linux Foundation. Uh, we have Cloud Native Computing. That's where Kubernetes comes from. That's where, um, oh geez, there's a whole bunch of projects under that. But anything, any cloud computing platform in the world now, AWS, uh, DigitalOcean, IBM Global Services, Microsoft Azure, almost all of them are running uh, cloud-native computing platform tools to manage them. Uh, Automotive-grade Linux, that's exactly what it, think, what it sounds like. It's Linux in an embedded environment in cars. I think, um, I think it was just announced recently that all Toyotas, starting in 2020, will ship Linux as its primary operating system for all the entertainment stuff inside the car. And then LF networking is just, um, I, I'm not exactly sure what that one is. But uh, in, in addition to these top level projects, you know, Hyperledger is one of them, we have about 70 of them total. So the Linux Foundation is positively huge. Uh, there's about 200 employees like myself that work for Hyperledger. Um, but our reach in terms of who uses our software and who works on our software is absolutely global. We're one of the largest. In fact, we probably are the largest nonprofit organization dedicated to open source software. Um, I would argue, I don't know the exact number, but I would guess that about 90% of the computers on the planet run our software, if not more. We're hosted, you know, Hyperledger is hosted by the Linux Foundation because of that guy, Crazy Finn. 
uh, Linus Torvalds, right? So uh, for those of you guys who don't know where the Linux Foundation came from, the Linux Foundation was created in the, the early 2000s um, when a bunch of industry companies, large companies, realized that they were building products using Linux and that Linux was the dominant operating system for all of their new products and their existing infrastructure. Um, and companies, uh, big companies like Intel and, and um, Apple, well not so much Apple, but Intel and IBM and you know, Fujitsu, Hitachi, Sony, they all realized that they were heavily dependent on Linux. And when they realized that Linux was created by a bunch of people sitting in their basements and garages and that there was no company behind it, uh, they had a real big problem with that. They actually invented this business model of creating a foundation, a nonprofit, that all of the corporations that use our software would join. And by join, they would pay a membership fee. And the membership fees are not small. I think they're, some of them are upwards of $5 million a year. Um, and that money goes to fund the, the foundation itself. And the original goal was to just gather enough money to pay Linus here, um, enough money that he could quit his day job and just focus on running the, the op open source um, project, uh, the Linux kernel project. So that became Linux Foundation's business model. We get corporate sponsors and that money goes to support the, the community and the employees that work for the Linux Foundation are dedicated to growing the community and some more supporting the community around open source projects. And so it's been a natural destination for any open source project that becomes significant. Um, say like the Node.js project, right? Uh, that started getting wide use in industry and the companies that were using it wanted to make sure that it would be around uh, in 10 years. So they pushed the community to join the, the Linux Foundation and now the Node.js uh, project is like 50,000 developers and they have a team of 10 at the Linux Foundation that their whole job is organizing events and making sure that the community has what they need to participate. So hyper, well, so yeah, some of the game changing initiatives hosted by the Linux Foundation, right? So we have open chain, let's encrypt, oh yeah. You guys know about let's encrypt? So it's the free CA, right? You can get your uh, TLS and SSL certificates for free. I wish I had the graph because before let's encrypt started, something like 20% of the web was encrypted. And I think as of recently, it broke 75%. So Let's Encrypt has, is responsible for encrypting half of the internet in under two years. It's incredible. Um, you know, of course, we got the Linux kernel. Oh, the Zen project is one of them, Node.js, Automotive Grade. So Core Infrastructure Initiative is about be, uh, best practices for servers and software running on servers. The JavaScript Foundation, right? Anyway, we got a lot, to, a lot of work to do. We got a lot of open source software that we have to help manage. So Hyperledger, right, I said it was a blockchain framework. The, um, Hyperledger actually was created in a similar way, except the open source project that initially started Hyperledger came from IBM. So it wasn't a garage operation. They, the developers didn't sit in their garage and, and build it. This was actually a product that IBM had developed and they didn't want to manage it. They wanted to open source it, and so they approached the Linux Foundation and suggested making the Hyperledger project, and they sought other corporations that wanted to work on enterprise blockchain, and they found Intel, and they found um, Soromitsu uh, at a blockchain conference, and several other key members of what is now the Hyperledger um, corporate sponsorship, right? So I'm gonna. So our main. Let me go through our main platforms real quick. We have five main platforms, and the, and the first one here, Hyperledger Burrow, is actually a, an EVM implementation. So it, it's a it's a blockchain platform that can run Ethereum smart contracts, but it can run them in an enterprise environment. Um, and why would you want to do this? Well, we have a lot of um, token-based startups who are in stealth mode that do not want to do prototypes on the public network. So they run Hyperledger Burrow to develop their Solidity contracts and to prove out their system to attract investors. And then, you know, it gives them an on-ramp onto the, onto the public network. 
Um, the vice versa, the, the opposite is also true. There was a lot of startups that started on the public network and then they realized that the transaction fees and, and the overhead of the public network made their solution um, non-viable and so they're taking them off the public network and they're running them privately on, uh, on the borough blockchain platform. We have Hyperledger Fabric. This is the one that came from IBM. It's probably the most well-known. Um, but it certainly has like the largest number of developers so far and, and it's been deployed um, probably wider than all the others. But uh, it, it's designed more around an enterprise environment. It runs really well in managed services, right? Because it came from IBM. This one is my, well, I'm not allowed to have a favorite. But right now, as of right now, it's, this is the one I'm most excited about, although I've been, I've been really getting into Aroha this week, and so uh, I, I think I'm going to be spending the next six months focusing on Aroha. But up until this point, Hyperledger Indie has been the one that excites me the most. It's designed around um, uh, self-sovereign identity. So it's designed around being able to store my information, my personal information, or not store it, but manage and track my personal information in a way that I completely control it. All my personal information is encrypted and I control it, but with Hyperledger Indie, you can build identity solutions where I can prove, use zero knowledge proofs to prove things about myself and I can do selective disclosure. So I can say I wanna give somebody my age but none, nothing else about me. Um, but I think the zero knowledge proof system is the most exciting thing because it'll allow me to do things like go to a, a bar and prove that I'm old enough to buy alcohol without actually telling them who I am or actually how old I am. Um, there's some prototypes being built right now where you can use a smartphone to just show you know, your picture and a QR code and they scan it and your picture comes up and it has a you know, check mark that says I'm old enough to, to drink alcohol. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the black X they put on your hand when they card you going into a party, right? Um, so this one here, nobody knows anything about this one. <laughs> this actually, Hyperledger Aroha, um, I, would you say, Slava, that most of the developers on Aroha are here in Technopark? About half, maybe, or more? I guess, I don't know exactly how much about in Technopark. Yeah, so Hyperledger Roha actually came out of Japan, but it's based mostly here. The developers are mostly here. Um, there's a number of projects being built on this now, actually over in the Techno Park. Lots of really interesting things, like probably the one that I'm most interested in at the moment. I mean, there's a lot of great projects, but the one that really got me interested was uh, being able to do atomic swaps across other blockchains using Aroha to track it. So if I have Bitcoins and I wanna buy Ethereum, or F, and someone else has F and they want to buy Bitcoins, They're, the developers over at Aroha are building a system where we can do an atomic swap. So like Slava and I want to exchange Bitcoin and F, we don't ever have to go to rubles or dollars or whatever, we can just do it directly. And Aroha actually makes that possible. Um, so then the last one is Sawtooth. This one actually came out of Intel. It was a research project in Intel. There's a very interesting thing about this. Uh, it uses a consensus mechanism based on hardware secure enclaves, which makes sense. I mean, it was designed to sell Intel chips, but when they designed it, they didn't have the, the secure enclave yet. They didn't have the SGX enclave. So they had to make the consensus mechanism pluggable so they could do different consensus mechanisms, um, which means that when other enclaves come along, we can plug them in. This, this proof of elapsed time actually emulates Bitcoin. So in theory, this permission blockchain could scale to Bitcoin sizes. The only requirement is, is that the, the, the POET consensus piece has to run in a secure enclave. So there are open source hardware secure enclaves being developed right now, and, and of course Intel has one and, and mobile phones all have them. Um, so this actually has a lot of potential. There's a lot of interesting projects around this. Um, for those of you who don't know what proof of elapsed time is, inside the secure enclave, it generates a random timeout, say like anywhere between five seconds and five minutes, and uh, then uh, it waits for the timeout to hit, and it does a digital signature inside the, 
the secure enclave that this is my timeout and then it transmits a block to everybody else in the blockchain. So it simulates the hashing without actually doing hashing. So in, in Bitcoin, all the nodes are doing this math problem, trying to find a random number that creates a hash that meets the criteria. And the first one to get it then just transmits the block to everybody else and everybody else val uh, validates it. Well, Poet does the same thing except there's no hashing. It's just using a random number generator. And you have to have the secure enclave because you have to be able to do a local attestation. You have to do a digital signature that says, this was my timeout and whatever. So anyway, it's very interesting. It has the same characteristics as Bitcoin. Uh, let's see here. Oops. I guess that's it. So um, I love working at Hyperledger. I get to travel all over the world, especially here. This was fun. Um, to talk about blockchains and to brainstorm about really cool ideas on, on what we can do with these decentralized systems. Um, like I said, I, I, I worked for Hyperledger the last two years. Before that, I worked for Mozilla and uh, was Mozilla's liaison between the Firefox team and the Tor browser team. So I have a lot of um, involvement with human rights foundation or human rights uh, organizations around the world. Um, working with political dissidents everywhere, including the United States, which makes really interesting living in the US. Um, then before that, I worked on Second Life and did some work in video games for six years. And yeah, anyway, I've been a computer nerd, a Linux nerd since the mid 90s. I've had a computer since the 80s. I mean, I'm just, my whole life has been being a computer nerd. So I'm really happy to be here. I, it's great to see all of you and thanks for coming out. Um, do you have any questions? Oh yeah, you can brought stickers. Great, Slava, you got a question. Can you tell us more? I heard that Hyperledger has some internships for students around the world. Maybe there are a lot of students out here, and you can tell us about those internships. Good question. So the question was: <laughs> the rumor is that Hyperledger has global internships. The rumor is true. Every summer, Hyperledger sponsors or, or has a number of internships that are sponsored by companies um, that we are always looking for very smart, forward thinking, interested in blockchain students. Computer science, preferably, but I guess it's not limited to that. If you have the skills necessary, like you know how to program and um, you really want to work hard, um, I encourage you to apply. So just to know, like we open applications, I think around March-ish, March or April. So if you go to the hyperledger.org website, there's a, there's a news feed, there's a blog, um, and we will announce it there. There's also a mailing list that you can join that we'll announce it on. Um, but yeah, I highly encourage any, all of you to um, apply. I'm actually making plans and coming back this summer. So if any of you get an internship, I might be your mentor and I might come back and hang out with you. And we can go over to the techno park and we can do some cool stuff. Um, an example of some of the projects that have been done. Well, I know that uh, the Aroha project had one this summer, but the, the intern wasn't as good as they'd hoped. But the, the project was to bring UTXO um, capabilities to the Aroha platform. So UTXO is what Bitcoin uses, right? And uh, the Aroha platform has some projects that could really use UTXO capabilities. So if you're a big fan of Bitcoin and you know how that works and you wanted to try your hand at, at programming um, and designing a, a new UTXO system from scratch on an existing blockchain, um, I'm sure they're, they're probably keen on getting help with that. So that might actually be another internship this summer. Um, this past summer, my, the intern that I mentored was working on using a tool called Shadow, which is... Um, it's a network simulation tool. It's used by the Bitcoin core developers to test changes to the Bitcoin network. It's a tool that allows you to take multiple computers, link them together, and then it simulates a network so that you can run 10,000 nodes, but on say like three computers, right? Um, you don't have to go out to the cloud or anything. It runs them in a way that allows you to record all the packets so that you can replay the packets. So if something happens, under simulation, under some tests, you can actually go back and repeat it and figure out what happened. But yeah, the core Bitcoin developers use it to test if a proposed change will actually break or, or harm the stability of the network. 
Um, the Tor network also uses it for the exact same reason. And um, we wanted to try it out, or we want to give it the capabilities to run Hyperledger blockchains so that we could run scaling tests, so that we could see how Aroha runs when there's a thousand nodes trying to do consensus, for instance. So um, yeah, I highly encourage all of you to keep an eye out and to join or to at least apply for an internship. Um, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Uh, we have a community big enough that we can, um, we can accommodate everybody. We've had interns in India, interns in South America. Like my intern is from uh, Colombia, I think, in South America. And we've had you know, interns from Canada and the United States, hopefully from Russia. So, yeah. Bruce, you were a student from Annapolis University, actually, and he was working at Indian. Yes, I'm not sure. No. He was working on what? On Indian. Indian. Oh. Yeah, Indian. He works on Indian. Oh, on Indian? Yes, it's Indian. Yeah. That's cool. So he's, a, he's one of the volunteer developers on Indy? Or, or no, he was, uh, he was an intern for Indy. He was an intern for Indy, yes. He is uh, our graduate from 2017. And he worked successfully, I guess, yeah. What was his name? Kuzman. Kuzman Shakov. Ah, yeah, that guy is great. So you guys are going to a good school. If, if you're all like that guy, I have high hopes for you. Uh, I'm going to give you the tough problems because you guys are all smart. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he graduated from here, and um, I, I've heard nothing but good things. The Hyperledger Indie team loved him. He did a lot of good work. Um, and yeah. you, should, you should know that actually, well, those internships are quite easy. Oh, yeah. I didn't mention that. Most companies do not pay interns. Hyperledger absolutely pays interns. And it's a very competitive wage. It's a stipend that will cover you know, all your living and whatever costs, right? So it's actually like getting a job, but it's for three months in the summer. And we'll pay you enough to not worry about anything else, not have to wor work anywhere else. You can focus on your, your internship. Um, all right, anybody else have any questions? Come on, ask me something about Second Life. I have crazy stories about Second Life. You once mentioned that you work for Apache or something related to it. Yeah, in the web stuff. Can I, can I what? Okay. Elaborate. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> actually it wasn't Apache. So how many of you guys know what Macromedia Flash was or it became Adobe Flash? Do you guys know what Flash is? Right, I see a few of the older guys. So back before we had actual JavaScript, in, well, we had JavaScript, but back before JavaScript got better and we had CSS and being able to do nice animations and, and, and really professional looking websites, the only way to do it was to run Flash. And Flash is a binary format and it ran as a plugin in the browser. Yeah, it, it was bad in the old days, I promise. It was really bad. Um, and so I was, the first developer in a startup in Seattle where we designed a server that could dynamically generate Flash movies on the fly. And so I reverse engineered the Flash format with a bunch of my friends and we wrote the first open spec on how Flash is encoded in a binary format. And then we built a server that could just do that. And we built the first um, like applications that looked like they were desktop applications, but they ran in the browser because we had forms and everything was dynamically populated. We built like the first real-time chat system on a web page because browsers couldn't do XHR back then, right? They couldn't make a JavaScript call to a server. You had to reload the page to be able to go to the server and get data back. So Flash allowed us to get around that and we built a, a whole community, you know, like forum and everything like that in Flash. But um, the one thing that the one thing that makes me uh, you know, proud and sad at the same time is that uh, we, the company existed from 1998 until the world, the, the first dot-com bubble burst, like in 2000. Um, right when the, the internet, first internet boom ended, we were demonstrating to Adobe an application running in the browser that was essentially YouTube. I could stream videos, and they could, you know, people could upload them and then the server would encode them and then using a flash interface you could create playlists and you could store the playlists and you could share links 
to the, the videos and all that stuff. So I can't say I invented YouTube, but I invented YouTube. Um, and uh, we were just too early. Uh, at the time, nobody had enough bandwidth and we couldn't figure out how to make money off of it because we were actually nice people and we weren't thinking that we should spy on everybody um, like YouTube does or, or, put, uh, or put ads in. We had just didn't consider that and so we couldn't figure out how to make money. And I, I distinctly remember demonstrating it um, to Adobe and Adobe was like really interested. They, we were in the process of being acquired when the whole world blew up and Adobe was like, you're gonna be out of money <laughs> in like three months. We'll wait for you to go out of business first. So anyway, the, that technology um, heavily influenced a, a product that Adobe later released called the Air Platform. It was a brief, like write once kind of platform. You write it once and it runs in a browser, or runs on a desktop, um, but it doesn't really exist anymore. Um, so yeah, th we had a lot of fun. The fr that was the first web boom and we had crazy, crazy parties. Like, it was just ridiculous. There was way too much money and we were way too young. Like, just loud music all the time. We were drunk all the time. <laughs> it was really fun. Any other questions? Some questions. First one uh, from probably Mr. Fondi. Typical point of view, can you please explain the slides for the projects? Yeah, sure. Hold on one second. Oh, all the projects, sorry. That one. So, uh, we got a lot of uh, capabilities. Uh, so, do they have only uh, the current blockchain or they just exist separately? They, okay, so the question was are they all the same thing or are they separate blockchains? So, these are actually platforms for building blockchains. Okay, so this, think of this as like uh, the Bitcoin D project, right? The core Bitcoin develop, like we're not actually building the blockchains ourselves, we're building the tools in which you can, like industry can set up their own blockchains. Okay, so these are the blockchain platforms and they all have a little bit different um, goals and different capabilities. Um, one of the ones I really like about Aroha is that it's written in C++ and it compiles down to fairly small and it's all in one, right? It's easy to deploy and easy to use. These others are a little bit more complicated. Um, these here are all tools related to blockchains. So Quilt is an implementation of, of basically doing um, uh, cross blockchain um, swaps of assets. Uh, Hyperledger Explorer is you know, like a blockchain explorer. It allows you to walk the blockchain and see what's in each of the transactions. Composer is actually a way of translating business logic into smart contracts to run on our platforms. Cello is a, is a tool for managing, spinning up networks on cloud platforms and then configuring those networks to run the, uh, the smart contracts from Composer, right? Currently, these two here only work with Fabric, although there are developers that are trying to make them work with the other platforms. And then Caliper is an, is an effort to try to um, figure out a way that you can compare the attributes of different blockchain implementations. So it's like, how do you compare like transaction rates or, or memory usage or whatever? It's just how to measure the attributes of the blockchain so, the, so that people know, so that the developers mostly, but also application developers know if they're optimizing you know, are they getting better throughput? Or are they getting better performance? So you have to have a tool to measure that. And blockchains are so unusual, the traditional measurement tools don't, don't apply, really. So we had to create a project to, cre to have our own measurement. Um, so that was your first question. Yeah, yeah. And the second was, uh, so you got uh, more customers? Just... Real customers. So there are a number of, of uh, production systems um, you know, those are good questions. I don't know the exact ones, but I know that we have our blockchains, well, so most of them are in proof of concept stage about to go production. The few that are in production are in mostly in cross-border payment settlement. So if one company in say the United States wants to send money to a company in the UK or in Russia, um, the, the blockchain is used to coordinate all of the movement of the money and the, you know, the global regulation of capital and all that stuff. So um, cross-border payments, there's also some, uh, in fact, actually this is one. You guys, do you guys know the company Walmart? 
Do you know what Walmart is? Are they here in Russia? Is Walmart here in Russia? Okay, so Walmart is this giant store that has everything, and they're everywhere in the United States, right? Um, this past year, there was a, a health crisis where salad, like greens, like fresh greens, were uh, contaminated, and they were making people sick, you know, like, like lettuce and things like that. And so a lot of stores in the United States had to go in and destroy all the lettuce because they couldn't figure out where the contamination was coming from. So Walmart actually use, is going to use, I think it's Sawtooth, um, and they're going to be tracking fresh greens from the farm through the distributor all the way to the store. So you'll be able to, I, I, in theory, I don't know if this is going to be part of the application, but in theory, you'll be able to scan the QR code with your phone, and it will tell you exactly when it was picked and where it was picked. And, and how long it took to get to the store, right? So they'll say, well, you know, it was picked in farmer, whoever's field down the street, and it, it's been on the shelf for three hours, right? So you know how fresh it is. So they're tracking it from farm all the way to the store, and the goal is to reduce or eliminate the, the danger, the food danger, right? Um, to track so that if there is a contamination, they know where it came from, basically. Do we actually need what? Uh, yeah, because yes, you do, because this is called a, a, a industry vertical integration because the farmer has his own or her own systems. And then the, the distributor, the person who collects from the farmer and takes to the stores has their own computer systems because they are managing trucks and drivers and all that stuff. And then Walmart has their own system, right? So these are all separate computer systems that all need to work together. And the easiest way to do that is to run a blockchain node so that uh, you're tracking what's called the provenance or the chain of custody of that food. At each point, um, you have a, a business, someone in a business who's going to touch the food, right, and, and do something with it. And they get to record a transaction. And, and the best thing, or sorry, the, 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 the primary application that you need, to, or the prim primary problem you need to solve here is trust. Okay, because we need to trust that when the farmer picks it, right, that that's accurate data going into the system. And also when, when the truck, you know, drives it to the store, that also has to be accurate data. And the farmer doesn't care about the distributor, the distributor doesn't care about the farmer, and the distributor doesn't care about the store, and the store doesn't care about the farmer. Like, nobody likes each other. Not, well, they might like each other, but nobody has to trust each other. But if they're all signed up legally, so that's an interesting thing about our blockchains because we're not on the public blockchain. Uh, it's part of their business. And so you sign contracts and you, and you participate in a blockchain in a, with a legal relationship. Um, and that gives the, the whole system, or it makes the rules applicable, right? So if the farmer's lying when, they're, when he's recording the transactions in the blockchain, the other farmers in the blockchain can you know, audit Right? They can go and check to see if they're right. And, and if they're not, whatever penalties are in the contract apply. Right? So it, one of the neat things about uh, blockchains is the fact that it has like a real-time state of the world. You always know um, what events have happened right? in real time. You know, previously, we used to have to feed stuff into a computer, and then at night, like overnight, the computer would process all the transactions called batch processing. That's how banks used to settle their books, and that's how most of these kinds of systems would work. And so you would always have like, a, like one or two days before you knew um, you know, which transactions had happened and which events had happened. Um, and with these blockchains, it, it's in real time now. And, because of the decentralized nature, it makes it very easy to integrate onto mobile platforms and things like that. So it's, it's decentralized collaboration for the, the modern mobile you know, internet. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, uh, is, is it true that uh, you, in this general release, requires you to store its approval? Sorry, I don't understand you. So try again. I didn't really hear you because she was making a lot of sense. Is it true that uh, you, in your kernel release, requires Linux Torvalds approval? Oh, do the new Linux kernel releases require Linux Torvalds approval? Um, hmm. You know, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Because he, he did step down for 419. 
but he's back now for four, or no, maybe he is back on 419 or 420. I, you know, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the, the answer to that. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me. Okay, the small question is, uh, you mentioned that you worked with the security problems in uh, Hyperledger mm -hmm. and somewhere else. What is the worst security problem you deal with and how you fix it? So the biggest security problems I've dealt with so far, well, we haven't had a lot in Hyperledger, actually, thankfully, because uh, it's fairly new software, but we've been doing it right since the beginning. I've been doing a lot of outside security audits, and things like that, so we haven't had a lot of problems. Um, there is one, though. Good job, Aroha team. <laughs> there, there was one that was coded uh, in Aroha uh, earlier this year that was critical enough that I had to get a CVE issued. You guys know what a CVE is? Okay, so for those of you who don't know what a CVE is, it's a critical vulnerability disclosure system. It's a global system that all software vendors participate in, and it's a formal way of saying, we found a bug in our software that's critical, and here are the details, and you should update to the new version, okay? So there was one in, in Aroha, and, and this is, answers your question directly, um, and it illustrates why cryptography is very, very hard to get right. They didn't write the cryptography, but their assumptions about how the cryptography worked were incorrect. Now, I wish I could draw something, because um, I could, I guess I can, huh? All right. I don't, it's, a, it's a highly technical bug, okay? So I don't know that I can explain it to you, but how many of you are familiar with what a digital signature is? How they work, you know? So you hash something, and then you encrypt the hash with a public-private key pair, right? You, you encrypt it with the private key, and then you can publish the public key and the encrypted hash and the original data, okay? So what happens is, in the Aroha project, they used uh, ED25519. It's a fairly well-known digital, or sorry, uh, uh, elliptic curve um, public, or asynchronous, or sorry, public key algorithm. Okay, ED25519 has a really interesting um, detail about it that makes it different from every other um, elliptic curve algorithm. It was designed to work in an embedded system, like watches and cars and stuff, um, where entropy is hard to come by. So what, that's an Americanism. So what I mean is embedded systems always start in the exact same state, and they tend to have limited interaction with the outside world. So getting truly random numbers on an embedded system is extremely hard. And most embedded systems cannot get enough entropy to get really good random numbers. Now, digital signature algorithms typically rely on getting a really good random number. It's called a nonce, right? And it's so that with the same data and the same key pair, when you do a, a, um, a digital signature of it, you actually put a nonce with the data, then you hash that, then you encrypt it. Okay, so the, the resulting digital signature actually changes every time you sign the data, even though you're using the same key pair and the same input, because there's a random number that gets thrown in there, okay? ED25519 was designed to, instead of use a random number, it actually uses, uses the hash of the original data and the hash of the public key as the source of randomness. And it then appends that to the data, then it hashes, and then it signs it. Okay. Now, the Aroha developers missed this detail. And they wrote their code thinking that if you had the same key pair and the same data, that you would always get the same digital signature. So they're, when they compare this digital signatures on blocks and on transactions, they were combining the public key plus the, the resulting digital signature binary, thinking that those two things together were going to be unique to, to each node's signature for a transaction. Okay. They also use open source encryption. So the security auditor that I hired to go and audit Aroha knew all about ED25519, and this is a common mistake when someone uses this library. So he has a version of ED25519 that does not hash for randomness. It actually uses a random number. 
So it acts like normal digital signatures, where with the same key pair and the same data, you get a different binary for each time you sign it. So he plugged his library into Aroha, and then he spun up a node, and he generated a bogus transaction, and he signed it three times himself with his same key, but because the, the resulting binary signature was different, because he was using actual random numbers, he then, you know, the signatures themselves actually looked different to Aroha, even though it was him signing it three times. And he sent it to the network, and the entire network went, <laughs> looks good to me. And so then he started, like, deleting, you know, assets and, like, you know, transferring, and he basically stole all the assets that he had in his network. You know, he had a test network that was tracking, like, I don't know, it was like cars or something like that. He, he made a test network to, like, simulate car dealerships, and then he promptly stole all the cars in the network. So, uh, <laughs> so we had to issue a critical uh, a CVE for that, and, and the code, these guys are really great programmers, the code was fixed like almost instantaneously. But it goes to show you that if you don't have very intimate knowledge about how digital signatures are created, um, you can fall into this trap. I mean, it was, it's, it's a well-known mistake that programmers make when they use ED25519. And that's why all the security guys like myself, we always immediately look at that. Because programmers like to assume that the digital signatures will always be the same. Uh, it's known as a deterministic signing algorithm rather than a random or non-deterministic signing algorithm. And it, most programmers who don't, aren't familiar with cryptography don't know that subtle difference. And so, we got gotcha. you. <laughs> But anyway, it's fixed and it's cool. So that was like that's one of the toughest ones we run into. It's like these tiny, tiny little details about cryptography that come back to basically make the whole system vulnerable. Yeah, um, I have. I could go all day. I have tons of stories like this. But um, I asked for a question about Second Life, so I'm going to hijack your question and I'm going to talk about a bug I found in Second Life. Um, this one actually enabled. You know, we're all adults here. I don't know if you guys remember Second Life, but there was a while there in Second Life where when you logged in and the weather, the random weather was raining, um, it wasn't actually raindrops, but penises. <laughs> okay, and so what happened was um, a, a ha we had a scripting language inside of Second Life that allowed you to like program basically what objects 3D objects were placed in the world and you could make them move and you could make them react to avatars interacting with them. And a hacker realized that the interpreter for that, that programming language had like a memory limit, but we had a bug in the interpreter that allowed you to escape it. And we had these things where we could like uh, check what objects were being rendered, right? But that list of like blacklist of objects was in memory just after the, the scratch space for the interpreter. So you can see where this is going, right? Okay. I don't know. I think the, the hacker just dumped our binary or something to figure this out, or it was just out of dumb luck. But he figured out a way to, to ba basically, well, let me ask you this. Do, have any of you guys seen the show Star Trek? It's an old sci-fi show, American show from like the 60s, right? Exactly, you know, live, live long and prosper. Um, so there's an episode, a famous one, called The Trouble with Tribbles, which are these little furry things that just fill the entire ship, you know, because they multiply. So this, we called this the Tribble Bug because he figured out that he could make the interpreter go into a loop generating uh, copies of, of like a cube, and it would quickly exhaust the available memory. And then if he, it was basically like if I did it a thousand times, it would, it would crash, but if I did it, the right number of times, and then I did another one, and then I did it one more time, what would happen is it, it caused us to get out of the memory and would overwrite memory that was our list of objects you couldn't render. And so he wrote a script, basically, that had a penis in it, in a box, and then he had a whole bunch of boxes, right? And then he said, make it rain, and he was able to overwrite this table so that the blacklist now contained the box, not the penis. And so then he said, make it rain penises. And the, the code was like, um, well, I can't rain boxes. <laughs> 
but penises are okay. <laughs> and so for, for like out of like two days, people were walking in and were like, what is going on? <laughs> and, and I just remember it took us a long time to figure out exactly how they did it. But um, th- that class of bug was actually pretty new. Um, th- the technique was not new, but the idea that an interpreted language that came from the client could cause the, the client's application or, uh, to, or even the server, that for that matter, to misbehave was actually pretty new because there weren't a lot of programs back then that had a programming language that the end user writ, wrote and then it was interpreted. Do you see where I'm going with this? So JavaScript is this, right? This is a language that's written by the, end, by the, you know, the, the app developer. It's interpreted on the client's side and in a virtual machine. And so the term for these kinds of bugs are, are called memspray bugs because these interpreters that interpret these scripts typically will store frames and, and, and data and things like that kind of randomly throughout the process memory. And so it's like spraying data into the memory of the process, okay? And I later encountered this again in Mozilla. There's a lot of mem- memspray bugs. Have you guys ever heard of the hacker Geohot? The guy who cracked like the iPhone and the PS4 and all that stuff. Um, he actually wrote a tool, it's available on the internet, that uh, allowed him to monitor Firefox and he could like rewind, like he basically made the clock go in both directions. So he would execute Firefox like inside of this, this debugging tool and he would get it to record everything as it was going and then he could like walk it backwards, right? And then he, it would also fed into Ida, or Ada, Ida Pro or whatever, the, the binary decompiler. And he was able to find a number of cases in Firefox where mem sprays, so JavaScript could actually put data in places that when you triggered a double free, uh, which is like in C++ where you try to call delete on a pointer more than once, um, would cause what's called return-oriented programming. So it, it would make the frames, the, the function frames unwind, and it would cause the instruction pointer to go wherever you want it. So you can take over a process this way. Remotely, by the way, just by sending like crappy JavaScript to it. Um, and Geohot actually would go to Pwn to Own, which is a hacking event where big companies come in and say, you know, here's our latest version of Firefox or, or Chrome. If you can cause a, a, a remote takeover of the process, uh, we'll pay you $100,000. And Geohot didn't have to have a job for like three years because he used his tool. He would come in and he, he would find like two or three uh, remote exploits in like Firefox or in Chrome. And they'd write him a check for, you know, $200,000 and then he would go home. So like he would make 200 grand in a weekend and then he would do nothing else the rest of the year other than play around with computers and write hacking tools. Um, and uh, the only reason he stopped is he said, I got bored. He's like, I just didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. So the, the way they, once they take over, what they always do is they, they run the, the system uh, it, command to basically uh, exec another process and they pop calculator. So like they start calculator.exe. So that's the signal that I've, I've taken over your browser. So you would run Firefox, right? And you would, you would load this page that Geohot made and it would execute some JavaScript and all of a sudden Firefox would kind of go, and then calculator would pop up. It was very interesting. I spent a lot of time looking at memory dumps, trying to figure out like, okay, these were all JavaScript frames, and then which way did the, the instruction pointer go? And actually, the most genius thing I figured out when I was doing this was, why don't I just use Geohot's tool? Because he published it open source. So I started using his tool to figure out exactly what he figured out, and I could fix those bugs. So this is the kind of stuff, I mean, when you get into security, like you have to, if you do what I do, which is like look at software that gets hacked and try to figure out how it got hacked. Um, I don't do it anymore, but I have done it for about 10 years. Um, you, you quickly realize that what you learned in school um, only got you about 10% of the way towards what you need to know. So there's so much stuff about how operating systems work and how compilers work, and how computer languages affect what the resulting binaries look like um, that affect how good you are at what you are, what you, you know, doing this kind of work. It took me years of studying on my own and playing around on my own to get to the point where I could actually take 
Firefox that was cra in a, and the input that would crash it and work my way through it logically and find the bug. A lot of these bugs, when I first started, I couldn't tell you how they worked because they're so crazy, so insane, so like complicated. Like 10 things have to happen before that one thing happens and then everything cascades down and then calculator pops up. Like I had no idea how they did it. Hackers are so incredibly clever and they're clearly infinitely smarter than I am. But I was able to catch up enough that I could at least figure out what happened after they did it. Um, and so, yeah, security is a fun job, but it's one of those things that it doesn't really get taught in college. And so going down that road for a career means you've got to spend a lot of time teaching yourself. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. How are we doing on time? I mean, I'll stay as long as you guys want to stay. See, I, I knew I should have brought my bottle of vodka. Just up here, like. So, so p.m. Hmm? It's 7 p.m. 7 p.m. I mean, if you guys want to stay, if you got more questions, I'll stay. Or not, or we can all go drink vodka. We're all meeting at the bar then? Well, yeah, and I have cards, business cards here. Um, so if you want to, if, if you have a question that you didn't want to ask here, feel free to email me. I will definitely get back to you. Um, and uh, remember about the internship. We will pay you to be an intern. And uh, thank you so much. You guys have been really great.